we will be having two more talks. Um, and, and we're following the format of um, uh, bringing together science and culture, culture and science, so science and culture, technology and society. So different ways of thinking about um, tea uh, from different approaches uh, to emphasize that this is the vision for the Global Tea Initiative to be an interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary study here on campus and that um, reaches out to the community because tea is like that. You want to um, savor tea with a friend. Um, so um, again, we have two more talks for the afternoon. Each will be about 30 minutes introduced by a UC Davis faculty member and then followed by a session of question and answer. Afterwards, you're all invited to join us for a light reception at Seasons Restaurant on 102 First Street in downtown Davis. Um, if I didn't give you the right address, it's, so it's at the corner of First Street and F. Um, so from seven, starting at seven o'clock to about eight o'clock or so like that. So everybody is welcome. Uh, and that gives all of us a chance to get to know each other more and relax um, and talk to the scholars. So now, uh, Dr. Susan Ebler is coming to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for the opportunity to do this introduction today. It's a great honor to introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Professor Kai Shen Chen. He received his PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park and did a postdoc at Johns Hopkins in pharmacology. He returned to uh, Taiwan, to the National University of Taiwan in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture. And at the same, close to around there, he also um, started to work with Hewlett Packard or Agilent, which is a, now called Agilent, which is a company that makes analytical um, equipment, some of which you'll be hearing about in his talk this afternoon. He now has his own company, um, and he does organic analysis, method development, um, equivalent to developing methods like what um, our Environmental Protection Agency, EPA agency, would use for analysis of toxic substances. And um, when I talked with him, and those are the kinds of papers, when I looked up his name, those were the kind of papers I found um, that he's published, is more in the toxicology, analytical method development area. When I talked with him just now, he said tea is his hobby. <laughs> um, but this is what we are going to hear about this afternoon. Um, and he's going to really link now the, these amazing aromas and flavors that we have been experiencing through either the tasting this morning or the tea this afternoon, trying to understand now the chemical components that contribute to these amazing sensory experiences. And so he'll be talking from an analytical chemist standpoint and relating that to sensory properties. So Professor Chen. Thank you, Susan. Uh, it's my privilege here. Uh, this is the second time I came to Davis. Very impressive. And I only have 30 minutes. I wish I had a little bit longer. But anyway, uh, I think the Susan that basically ex explained my uh, a little biography. I am a man of diversity. I am a horticulturist, but I do analytical biochemistry. And the, I was a professor. And I also joined a multi-international company to do uh, analytical instrumentation work. Now I'm, I own my own company, and I also go back to teach in the university as a payback. Because when I, when I go back to a National Autonomy University uh, as an associate professor, I was geared up to do research. But when I tried to buy an instrumentation from Hewlett Packard, I failed. Instead, I joined Hewlett Packard. I sell myself. <laughs> uh, after I served as 10 years for, uh, in Hewlett Packard, I decided I want to do something uh, back in horticulture, so I go back to teach. Now, you're going to, I'm going to navigate a little bit, uh, twist 
the economic development, financial implication, and also the tea culture and the science, all in 30 minutes. Now this, this little, uh, we have a building in Taipei called Taipei 101. It used to be the tallest building in Taipei. Now I can tell you that if it's not because of tea, we will not have the Taipei city and we will not have the tallest building in Taiwan. This is how important tea to Taiwan is. Now let me show you at this pretty uh, picture, the playbill, the very first playbill in Japanese occupation period, which is uh, targeted as the, uh, the tea export. It shows the elegance of Taiwan tea. So I will be presenting to you uh, several objectives. The first one is the production history in Taiwan, very short one. And the, I probably will skip the second one. This is the enjoy the sensory appraisal of smell, smell the tea essence. I actually have carried a very small sample of tea essence, but with such uh, overwhelmingly uh, audience here, I don't think that I can uh, give to everyone, so I will keep it myself. So after talk, if you have interest, come to me, I can show it to you. And the third one is uh, a nest develop, development of Taipei with the international tea trade, which is vitally important and very, very interesting. And a five generation of Taiwan version of the oolong tea. And you all know about oolong tea, but probably very few of you know that we have five version of oolong tea. And actually, there's a sixth ver version of oolong tea. The sixth version is in my hand. I created it. Uh, the, the last one was demonstrating the, the craftsmanship uh, in the Taiwan the tea making. So before I navigate uh, the all four objectives to it, I will show you one very, very interesting playbill. Uh, this is the, uh, the early Taiwan map. Uh, before 1600, there's no one claim uh, the government sovereignty of Taiwan. The first government set up in Taiwan actually was built by the Dutch. Uh, and this is the one, uh, the very interesting one. It's called the Champagne of Tea. Yes, it's Formosa Oolong Tea. This little playbill, which is uh, posted in New York, close to uh, 1911, uh, because that you have the Model T car, the Ford car behind it, and you see that all the gentlemen are well dressed up, and they're serving uh, the oolong tea in a champagne glass. And this is how I get interested with uh, the, the history of tea. Now, if we look back the long history, the very early documentation of Taiwan tea actually was 1717, which is a central part of uh, uh, Taiwan, those of you been to Taiwan, you must know there's a very famous place called Summon Lake. Uh, and they still have some wild tea grow over there. And in those days, the capital city of Taiwan is not in Taipei. Taipei in those times, uh, which is northern part, uh, is actually uh, uh, occupied by the Aborigine. The capital city of Taiwan in those days is Tainan. Okay, so unfortunately, the beginning culture, uh, the cultivation of the people who have immigrated from China, they settled in the central part, the southern part of Taiwan in, uh, close to Tainan. And they tried to grow tea over there, but they failed. So today, I will sh later show you in the entire demographic distribution of tea. There are many, many counties in Taiwan grow tea. Tainan is the one county that hardly have any tea plantation over there. So it's not our ancestors' fault, but Tainan basically doesn't suit, suitable for growing tea. There's a uh, soil and climate reason for it. And I know that Catherine is very much interested to, to bring the tea plantation uh, the real tea industry and growing tea in this uh, vicinity area, and it is high. I also hope it will make through, but there are some magic with the soil. 
So you may have to deal with the soil, and it is very likely, in my mind, that you can grow tea around Davis, and I hope that uh, this thing will come true. Now, uh, nowadays, you still can find some uh, higher mountain wild tea growing in the southern part of Taiwan. I personally have to actually go to some site to see that wild tea do exist. And two people do go there, like uh, agroforest uh, method, uh, to collect those wild tea and make those uh, wild tea. In the ancient time, those wild tea have different names. They're called fairy tea. They have very, very bitter taste. However, they probably have very strong, in today's scientific terminology, have very strong uh, uh, chain, so have very strong after-sweet taste, which is, the professor said, hui gan, uh, hui wei, okay. Now this is the, the tea tree looks like. Contradict to most people's common impression, uh, tea are shrub, but tea actually can be very tall, 20 to 30 meter tall, as a very uh, tall tree. And I will skip this one. But you can keep that in your mind that you have a chance to smell it. Now, the early history of tea production, uh, owing to these two gentlemen, the very first one is a Scottish called John Dodd. He came to Taiwan close to uh, 1864, which is just a little bit after the Second Opium War. And he came to Taiwan to explore the business opportunity. Basically, he wanted to trade camphor out of Taiwan and sell opium into Taiwan. In today's, well, in those days, those traders, they do things like this. And the, unfortunately, the opium trade was occupied by some other foreign traders and uh, he had very little chance to, uh, to, to take over that. So he was exploring some other possibility, and tea happened to be one of them. Now, in 1865, he inquired some of the Danshui farmer the possibility of tea trade. But the most important thing is in 1866, he uh, hired a competitor, which is Li Swinson, the gentleman be, uh, just lowered. Do I have the, the lighter? Oh, no, never mind. Now, the gentleman, Li Chunsen, later became the second richest man in Taiwan, basically selling tea. So I think this little uh, implication inspired all the audience that if you want to do the tea trade, this is the model. Uh, he actually come, those two gentlemen, John Dodd and, and Li Chunsen, they were in excavation of camphor and go to, uh, right now it's a Taipei Tea County, they go to see the camphor site. In those days you can actually uh, ride a little boat to a, a, a place called Da Xi, the Great, Great Creek. And on the way back, they actually they have seen uh, some tea cultivation on the riverbank they come up with the most genius idea, which I think is most important for the Taiwan economic development much later on. In today's mind, they are the very first venture capitalists in Taiwan and put into the practice. So I will interpret the history in this respect. Like, like I said, that's, that's a, uh, uh, Catherine, you are sitting here, your neighbor, actually growing tea. So they come up with this idea, have Li Swenson come to Catherine and tell Catherine that, Catherine, your neighbor grow tea, would you like to grow tea? Catherine says, think about it, hmm, interested, but I don't know how to grow tea. So Li Swenson said, you don't worry about it, I will have someone to teach you to do that. But I don't have the tea seedling. You don't worry about it, I will provide the tea seedling. Then the question comes, mm, if I grow tea, who I sell it to? I don't know how to sell tea. You don't worry about it, I buy everything back. Sounds good, isn't it? The very last question is, but I have very shallow pocket, I don't have money. Then here comes the genius idea, I will loan it to you. Now, to this part, it's everything today like 
a modern agricultural contract manufacturing or contract growing, but this does not make them into the venture capitalist. What most genial part of it is in those days, John Dodd itself is a very small trader, uh, the foreign trader. He himself does not have a very deep pocket. He was so clever and so convincing, he went to mainland China, went to that location called AMOY, which is today Amoy, Emeng, Xiamen, to find some rich men, capitalists, and borrow the money from those rich men and serve as a financial institution along to the farmer. So immediately, he get an interest income. Now, as a very smart businessman, he does not stop there. So he do a very first try order. So he ship in 1867, shipped the very first shipment by himself to Macau to test whether the Taiwan tea has the quality to be a potential merchandise. Now, for those of you who can see it, and I listed the, uh, the entire export. Uh, the, the data is actually from one American journalist called J.W. Davidson. He wrote the very first English book about Taiwan, uh, which is the island of Formosa, past and present. In that book, they have a very specific T chapter and I copy, I, I use this data from the book, which listed from 1871 all the way to one year after the Japanese occupation, uh, 1896. You can see on the, on the, on the chart that the, uh, the Taiwan export of tea is steadily increased, almost in a linear fashion. So is the India and Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka today. On the other hand, the main in China, the exportation decline. Uh, the overall, the entire world export, exports steadily increase. So bas basically demonstrated in the entire tea trade, the dominance of the China power actually diminish over 30 years. Now this is a very interesting uh, export data. All the data shown in this graph is from our custom. Now I've stopped here to tell you a little bit about Taiwan. In 1895, uh, 1894, uh, the Qing Dynasty were having a war with Japan, and Qing Dynasty was defeated. So in 1895, Taiwan was given away because of com war compensation to Japan. In those years, very sadly say today, Taiwan was the only province in the entire 11 provinces of China who have the trade surplus. And if you look at the district of the Taipei, the most busiest district in Taipei, about 25% of people actually was addicted to the opium. So can you imagine how much tea you want to export in order to compensate the deficit? to have a trade surplus. So that tells you how important of the tea is. Basically, the, the statistic data here showing that almost 80% of the export in northern Taiwan were well, actually tea. That's how important of it. Now, there are a couple of interesting parts. Uh, I have to show you very quickly. They are three versions of oolong tea. Remember, I show you the oolong tea, uh, the champagne of tea. In those days, the oolong tea are not today's ball shape of oolong tea. It's, it's, a, it's a flat shape, it's an oolong tea. This is the very first version of the oolong tea. And the, uh, there's a little uh, crisis of, of uh, 1873, because after John Dodd have do this contract uh, manufacturing in, in Taiwan, all the foreign trade house starting to do the same things. So all of a sudden, the Dunsrey River, the major port to ship uh, the, the tea was, was so fascinating, everybody was doing the same thing. And it created an imbalance of the, the supply and demand. And interestingly, in 1869, 
John Dodd actually hired two ship fully loaded with tea from Dan Sui Harbor direct to New York. Can you imagine what that is? Taiwan is on the side of mainland China. How do you have a ship from Dan Sui Harbor all the way to New York? Because 1869 was the year that Swiss Canal was opened up. So actually, they go to all the way to the Swiss Canal and across the Atlantic Sea to the New York Harbor. However, in the history, there's only one or two times that the, the ship would sail direct from Taipei to New York. The rest of it, because the Transcontinent uh, Railway was built, and later on was much easier and safer to ship the, all the tea, mer tea merchandise to San Francisco and then using the railway to New York. But Taiwan, from the beginning, was doing tea trade internationally. It's very important. Now, because of the, the tea imbalance, uh, so there's a panic in uh, 1873, because in New York, in late 72, they find that some inferior product shipped from Taiwan. Uh, in those days, they don't have uh, the call cell phone, so you can call immediately know what happened in the marketplace. And it, uh, the message that came across much later, half year later, so the beginning year of 73, all the good tea was made because the contract manufacturer, beautiful tea, lay up in the shipping port, but no foreign trade house was there to buy it because they, they were very much afraid that New York wasn't going to accept it. So all this good tea was sitting there for months until the Chinese tea trade house get in to buy most of the tea and ship it to mainland China, ship it to Fuzhou. And because it's, it's sitting in the dock, uh, the, the port for three, four months, and they have a little bit of flavor. So when they ship to the, uh, the, Fuzhou, the, the Fuzhou, they add the jasmine flower to it to make a square pack of it. This become the second version of oolong tea, the called baozong tea. Now, uh, in the later year, later months of the 73, the message came back from New York. The early shipment to New York was well accepted, extremely good quality of it. So the confidence get back, the business resume, and we have continuous consecutive eight years of very, very good promise uh, of the tea trade uh, to, to New York. And the, uh, that create the third version and I will tell you much later uh, the third version of Oolong tea. Now this is, this is, there is actually two commercial districts, and the city was actually built between these two districts. Okay, you can see on the right-hand side of the map, they have the city wall. Inside the city wall was actually rice field in those days, which is 1884. And Taipei City was built because there's a need for it. Before the Taipei city was built, if you have a commercial dispute, you have to go to Xinzu to get the, the, the judge. They don't have judge in Taipei city. Because there's so, many of, so much of the foreign trade and the, uh, the final decision is to set up a, a, a city to it, this is how the city looked like. And the, uh, this is the west gate. This is the only gate in the entire China who have a railway go through with it because you have to ship tea. And you have a little lipo on the back which is show electricity. All this thing was built in 1887. And Taiwan and also Taipei become the most modern city in those time. And unfortunately was given away to, to Japan. Now these two gentlemen were so interesting, they, they are the people, the, the real spirit, the tea spirit, the real spirit behind the, all the fragrance. They actually invent a very special method to create the floral scent of the oolong tea. When I was in the third year of the university, my professor was sitting just like me on the stage, talk to all the students and say that we actually purchased a very advanced instrumentation called gas chromatograph 
and we identify from the non-floral scented oolong tea, which is baozong tea, a component of the jasmine flower. This intrigued my curiosity because jasmine flower is nothing related with tea. One is flower, the other is leaf. How can a leaf generate a floral aroma? And I have this puzzle for 30 years until much later I came back to teach and I discovered myself, rediscovered myself again. Now this will tell you what I call a zone tea. Basically it's a square pack, literally called a square pack. And you see the left corner, lower corner, you have three pack together because each pack is a 150 gram. The three pack add together is very close to one pound. This is how in the ancient days, that how, do, how do they do international trading if you have a different weighing unit. And I was doing tea research myself and I go to the tea plantation to make tea. This is tea master, they have all the metal on the, on the back, which is in Taipei. So those of you who happen in the future, if you visit Taipei, you want to grab some souvenir and you happen to be a tea lover, strongly encourage you to buy tea from Taipei. We have good tea in Taipei. <laughs> now I will go very quickly. This is uh, a zoologist. Uh, uh, he actually uh, named a lot of birds in Taiwan. Uh, he wrote a paragraph talking about the tea of Taiwan. He called the taste of tea is very fair. And the objection to it is the cross mold in which the tea, the leaves are prepared and packed. However, uh, the hill is not great distance from the harbor. It could be obviated by an energetic speculator who might visit the spot and on which the article is grown and make their own arrangement. This spark a lot of people's interest to do tea trade. Now, I'll go very quickly because I want to talk about the fragrance. But starting from 1877, all the foreign trade houses are doing exactly the same thing, doing international tea trade in Taipei. And also in 1886, the telegram cable was built from Taipei, from Taipei to Fuzhou across the, yes, so Taipei was not that back, back, backward. It was very, very much uh, developed. Uh, after that, well, in the, in, in the time that actually French invaded Taipei, uh, and we have the French-China war, and the French was defeated. Uh, and then after the war, the John, John Dodd feel that m not much thing interesting for him to do. So he gave away all his tea business to his competitor, uh, Li Sunsen, and uh, we have not identified uh, the John Dodd story afterward. It's very sad. I want to know more about this uh, very important and intelligent person. Now I'll start from the 1895, the Japanese occupation start, okay, the Japanese occupation did one thing that was very important for the Taiwan tea development. They started to do a massive tea research and excavation. Go to each of the tea master and find out what is the best mechanism. And they identify those two gentlemen, uh, the, the uh, Baozong tea methodology was the best. They forced them to teach others. It was a trade secret for the tea master uh, those tea masters have no other way but giving away their technology. But this thing encouraged all the tea manufacturer, uh, tea masters in Taiwan. So actually direct uh, the aroma direction for over 100 years. And the, uh, the fourth generation of oolong tea, the oriental beauty tea, so for those of you who know Oriental Beauty Tea, this is the most organic tea in this planet because we rely on a little buck. I will tell you a little bit on that. The fifth version of it is a ball-shaped uh, uh, oolong tea, which is infused, integrate the floral aroma generation process together with uh, compact the entire leaf into a bowl shape. So keep all the flavor uh, intact. And this, the five, this, these five generations of uh, oolong tea making process actually uh, 
was, was a foundation for all the tea lovers in the world to enjoy uh, the Taiwan oolong tea. But the most important thing is the tea ceremony started in 1980. We have the dual cup method, which I will show you in the later slide, that how we create an elegant way of drinking tea, oolong tea. Now I have a very short slide to you how the tea was made. This raw tea and put under the sun to do the dehydration, we call withering, and you bring back room to rehydrate it. And then uh, you painting it, you actually kill all the and then reaction to it. And then you roll it and then twist it. And this is the way you make the, the bow shape. Uh, and then finally you dry it and become the bow shape of the oolong tea. There are three kinds, at least three kinds of the oolong tea in Taiwan. Uh, this is a loosely non bow shape Winsan Baozong tea, which is as a greenish tea. The fermentation degree is about 15 to 20 uh, percent. This is a little bit heavier uh, fermentation called Dong Ding Oolong tea, which is a bow shape. And the, uh, the Mu Zha Tie Guan Ying, which is actually from Anxi. Uh, and this is the Oriental Beauty tea. Now, this is a little, uh, this is a little bit older GCMS. This is how I do the analysis uh, in, uh, in my university. The left side is called SPME, the called solid phase microextraction, basically serving as a nose. They have a little fiber inside. You can put inside the glass jar, could, will absorb all the fragrance, volatile material in the little fiber and concentrate over there. And then you introduce in, into the instrumentation and then here comes the chromatograph. Now, I have two, tra two trays of this analysis. One upper trays, uh, it's a first, uh, first of the end twist, which is basically when you bring the leaf inside, indoor, you're sitting there, and then you start to do a little bit uh, rolling and twisting, and we generate uh, some of the, the grassy note. The very first one was a hexanol, and then the second one, a hexanol. These are the aldehyde, which is contribute to the grassy note. And during this, uh, the process, you generate some fragrance material like the acetate, which is the ester, and some of the terpenes like osimian, nilaluo, and the uh, geranium. But a very light, these are the very light fragrance, so when these green, the tea are green. But after you, you make, uh, finish all the process and then make, make into the, the tea liquor, and then you analyze the tea liquor, all the grassy note disappeared. Now you have, obviously you have a lot of alcohol and you have a lot of uh, terpene, you have a linoluo again, geranium, the most interesting part of it. Uh, well, it happened that when you talk about important things, <laughs> Murphy's Law, but anyway, my professor, 36 years ago, was talking about the cis jasmine. This is the key component for a good quality of oolong tea. And also, in the chromatograph, you'll see that the, the D neralidol, which is, which is by its literal name, is from a flower of neroli. So you'll see that the good tea master are so creative they can actually control the fermentation process to generate all the flowery note from the raw tea leaf, but must follow a very dedicated procedure to do that. Now, I have a question uh, during the various period when the cisjasmon was made. And actually, I have identi identified uh, a particular time and what particular method to do that. That's why I use this as a guide to make my own tea. Now, this is the organic, a modern organic tea plantation is in Taipei. So we do preserve some very good plantation in Taipei and it's a very beautiful place. And uh, well, a lot of people, they, uh, they talk about what's special about Taiwan. Uh, we have the right weather, 
we were doing the international trade, we have the right elevation. Well, we can grow tea from the sea level all the way to 2,800 meters. We have the good craftsmanship, continue for 100 years. And we have the science extension, which continue to do the research and development, including cultivate, cultivated variety breeding. And National Taiwan University have two tea plantation of its own. This is the tea plantation in Meifeng, which is 2,000, uh, 2,100 meter tall. And we have another one which is close to Shito, is called Phoenix Valley. And we have various tea. Over the 100 years, 150 years, tea, people in different regions of Taiwan actually generate their own tea. So we have very fruitful a variety of oolong tea and some other kind of tea. And we also do tea breeding. So in Taiwan, the science behind it is great in depth, not only in the process, in analyzing, but also in breeding it. And uh, the, the curiosity quest is, if you're using the same methodology, well, different tea varieties generate different flavor and fragrance. The answer, the, the answer is yes. It will it very much decided not only by the craftsmanship of the master, but also by the genetic background of it. These are the different type of tea. I will go very quickly because I want to show you the food safety is vitally important. So if someone asks that, if it's possible, I can find a tea variety or tea kind or category which guarantees safe, I can tell you this is one. This is called uh, the Oriental Beauty or called the Bluffing Tea. Uh, I will tell you, if you're interested in why they call Bluffing Tea, I can tell you later on because we are short of time. But the five color tea will be generated by a little bug called the, the small green leaf hopper. It will only generate it if the small uh, green hopper uh, suck the juice out of the tea tree. It will actually in, uh, stimulus the, the tea, tea plant itself as a protection mechanism. And then s s uh, the, s those kind of the phytoelexin, which is the plant protect himself, will generate a special aroma. It will create a honey-like aroma. It's very special. Basically, if you spray pesticide over it, you kill the bug. And once you kill the bug, you don't have this tea. So if you have this tea, it's, generate, it's almost guaranteed it's a very safe one. And we have a, a graduate student to do uh, uh, analytical work it's using two-dimensional electrophoresis, identify four different proteins. Some of them are enzyme, which, which guarantee that you will have some different biochemical process inside. And uh, the student, the graduate student, also analyze different flavor and have identified more than 10 different flavor components have different level, or, or it's actually some of it's not seen. In the most important thing is after the infestation of a little bug, if a higher indole, and also you have a higher cis jasmine, presented in the Oriental Beauty Tea. Uh, I will end up very quickly. Uh, as a tea uh, hobbyist, and the, I do a lot of a tea talk. I was teaching tea in National Taiwan University. We have a, uh, the, the, a, a workshop uh, I will teach every year to the foreign student. That's uh, one of the class offered in National Taiwan University purely in English. And this was another workshop I had do it uh, in 2015 in Heidelberg. And the, uh, this is called the, the dual cup method. You'll find it's actually a tall cup and a short cup, okay? You pour the tea into the tall cup and then you cover it with a, with a short cup and you flip it over it and you smell it. You smell the tall cup because the aroma condensed inside the smelling cup will, uh, will actually have different degree of volatility. So it's, it's a time lag, a fragrance test. 
And the, uh, I have one American friend ask me that, why, why you serve tea with a little, little cup like this? They, it, it's not a big jar, and people don't have the luxury to drink a big gulp. Why you want to do that? I call it, this dual cup method, it's a drinking elegance. Because when you first brew the tea, the temperatures are very high, they're very hot. So if you have a big cup, you can't drink it because it's too hot. Then if you pull the tea into the, the smelling cup and you flip it over it and you start to smell it, you actually enjoy it. Like uh, the five cents or six cents, in, at least enjoy two cents. One is a smelling sense, one is a taste. Now, by the time you smell the, the, the aroma over it, and then you start to drink it, the temperature's right on. So we show it a courtesy to the host, because the host give you a tea, you drink it in an elegant way, it's a manner of courtesy. Now, of course you can put music behind it, and add more to it. And this is how you, you, you smell it. And uh, we have one tea master uh, open up a tea store in Paris. And she invited the two uh, uh, to the, uh, the wine tester to test their sensory uh, sensitivity. And they were very much surprised that the fragrant change inside the smelling cup is actually faster and more fascinating than, than the wine, wine testing. Now, the very last one, we talk about the sensory. This is the little work I do. Uh, I'm specializing making non-bitter taste of tea because I find the mechanism to make tea uh, taste sweet. And it actually do have some sugar content inside. So I identify in the oolong tea, you have sucrose, you have uh, myo-inositol, you have a glucose, you have the galactopyranose, uh, you have the fructose, without adding any sugar to it, if you make it in the right manner. So, this close my remark. Thanks for all your attention. Thank you.